There we go, that's good. So, when should I start? Whenever you're ready. Now is a good time? Take a head start, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, well, we're five, it's five to nine. We're a few minutes early. So, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak, and I guess the first of the first RQI circuit. I think this is a very inspiring uh, effort, student run, student organized. It's, it's uh, great. And I remember when I was a graduate student beginning, talks consisted of taking um, these acetate sheets and using colored markers and writing on them and putting them on overhead projectors. Now we have live stream all over the world. That's a big change. Uh, I was asked to speak about uh, not so much about a specific research project, but rather about research going on uh, here at Waterloo in my group and partially connected with uh, the other groups here that work on RQI. So I thought I would say something about uh, quantum probes of black holes, which is something that we've been doing a lot of here. But before going ahead with that, uh, I thought I'd say a little bit about relativistic quantum information itself, which I like to think of in terms of this Venn diagram, which is the overlap of relativity, special and general, quantum physics, uh, whether it's quantum field theory or quantum mechanics, and uh, information, uh, particularly quantum information, but in general the information sciences. And this subject is interested in all three of these things, and in particular, the overlap between them, most especially, oh, I guess I can use this thing here, uh, this overlap right here, but a lot of discussion goes along in these uh, two-way Venn diagram overlaps. So we're interested in how relativistic effects influence quantum information tasks and vice versa. Versa, which really is right in the core of that. So now will this switch it? Oh, good. So my group, I've listed them here, and I've put them in the different uh, categories in the circle. I work on all three of these areas, though the quantum area that I do the most in that's strictly quantum is in quantum chaos uh, with Amit and Sanchit. Uh, and over here in gravity, we... Uh, I have Nicola de Kock, Michael Gammon, Braden Hall, Meng Chi Liu, and Jia Yu Yang. Uh, the largest fraction up here, though, is in RQI, as you can see, Juman Bhattacharya, Taylor Say, uh, Lakshay Goyal, Arenio Membre, Max Spadafora, uh, Dicky uh, Suryat Maja, Sija Wang, Everett Patterson, and Maria Rosa Preciado Rivas. There is also, uh, I've got some former group members that worked on various things here, and some, like Lana Bozanic, will be speaking here. It's hard to know when you count as current or former. Uh, I tried to partition it by whether a project had been completed or not that I might give some brief mention to here. So what are the kinds of projects in broad brush strokes? I've got them uh, listed here of the various things that we do in my group that are of interest, things like higher curvature gravity or black hole chemistry, which is a derivative of uh, black hole thermodynamics, and uh, uh, tests of general relativity. In quantum chaos, we've done some, a lot of work on Wigner negativity and its meaning for entanglement on the quantum kick top uh, in recent times. That's work in progress. And in RQI, we think a lot about what it means for things to be quantum entangled and how entanglement can be extracted from the vacuum or how it's affected by curved space-time. Uh, we're thinking a lot these days about what it means to do superpositions of quantum superpositions of space-time. And uh, we also work on, uh, which is what I'll talk about here, quantum probes of black holes. And I thought of putting a lot of these belong in the uh, 
overlap regions here and I tried to put them in but it became too crowded so I thought it would be easier to do it that way. So the recent research projects having to do with quantum probes of black holes are, I'm going to talk about three of them, one with Everett Patterson on estimating the parameters of a black hole using RQI methods, uh, a second which has been done with a number of people, uh, Ken Yoshimura who's here, Erickson Joa, uh, Keith Eng, Chen Zhang, and Yorma Luko, uh, and current work with uh, Maria Rosa, Manar Naim, a recent MSc student, uh, Max Spadafora, ongoing work, Yorma Luko, and uh, beginning projects with Sajia Wang. And then finally, I'll say a little bit about work on black holes and superposition. Uh, this is work with uh, Shamila Arabachi, another uh, graduated master's student, Dicky Suryamacha, Matthew Robbins, Josh Fu, Magdalena Zyke. Now I'm sketching these out. You're going to hear about some of these things in more detail at this meeting. So I'm not going to steal your thunder, Dicky or Maria Rosa, and so on. So. Quantum detectors, you hear a lot about this in RQI, and you'll uh, hear some throughout the meeting. They are model systems that couple to quantum fields. They are, if you like, the theorist's view of an atom or of a detector. And they provide us with an operational approach to probing quantum fields. Uh, and the standard example in the real world is indeed an atom. An atom, if you like, can be regarded as a detector that responds to an electromagnetic field. It can absorb a photon, which makes its internal state gain energy, an electron jumps to a higher level, or conversely, it can emit a photon when an electron drops down a level. This is something we all learn about uh, when we first encounter not only quantum mechanics, but in fact chemistry. And the simplest atom, for a theorist, is a qubit. It is a two-level system with a ground and excited state, ground and excited, separated by some energy gap that's a property of the object. It's often called an Unruh DeWitt detector after Bryce DeWitt, who uh, was responding in part to criticisms that the Unruh effect, which is the phenomenon that uh, a uniformly accelerated object will experience uh, being in a heat bath. Uh, critics said that's a formal result, you'll never actually be able to measure it. Well, the introduction of this device showed that it could be measured in principle, and nowadays people are actually trying to directly construct such a device to see if the effect can be measured. Uh, so I'll often draw the UDW detector like this little box with two levels. It's like a quantum dot in some sense, and a key quantity of interest is what I call P, the probability that this thing will get excited if it begins in the ground state. So uh, we deal a lot with two plus one dimensional black holes in my group, and I thought I would say a bit about why. Uh, the main reason, is that they are the simplest setting for exploring non-trivial black hole physics. Uh, they have a spatial structure, unlike one plus one black holes, where the horizon is a point. Here, the horizon has uh, length. It's got a perimeter. And it, the simplest version solved the Einstein equations. This solution was discovered 30 years ago in the early 1990s, 1993, and uh, uh, people have used it all over the place in theoretical physics to understand quantum gravity better, uh, to understand um, various properties of uh, black holes better, and here we use it in RQI. Uh, one of its key features is that the space-time has constant negative curvature, and the reason why this is of advantage is it makes calculations of density matrices, detector responses, all kinds of other things much, much simpler than they are in higher dimensional settings, typically. So, uh, for example, the Whiteman function, which is a 
uh, the two-point correlator of quantum fields, perhaps the most commonly uh, considered objects in, object in quantum field theory, it becomes an image sum instead of a mode sum because of the constancy of curvature. Now in higher dimensional constant curvature spaces, that's also true, but what's not true is that black holes typically have constant curvature there, whereas in 2 plus 1, the standard uh, black hole does. That's why we consider it. And the hope, as is the case when you consider not fully physically realistic settings, is that what we learn about black holes, about quantum physics, about quantum information, will carry over in some sense to the real world. So let me sketch out a little bit for this. The 2 plus 1 black hole is uh, born out of anti de Sitter space time, which itself can be constructed by considering this flat space with two time directions. And what you then do is consider this uh, constraint imposed into flat space. So you have this hyperboloid, and you constrain it to be embedded in that flat space, or rather, you, cons you constrain yourself to be on that surface in the flat space. And then uh, what you find when you incorporate those together and simplify uh, the coordinates is you get this metric, which is the 2 plus 1, well, the D uh, plus 1 dimensional uh, anti de Sitter metric, where the quantity L is related to the negative cosmological constant lambda that characterizes the space. And you can actually visualize what this surface looks like if you are in 2 plus 1 dimensions, so I drew it there. If you consider a scalar field that is conformally coupled, then there's an old result going back again some 30 odd years that shows the Whiteman function, the thing I had on the previous slide, is given by this expression that is a function of the geodesic separation between the points x and x prime. Uh, the quantity zeta refers to the boundary conditions of the scalar field, whether they're Dirichlet, transparent, or Neumann uh, out at spatial infinity. Now, you can compare this to what is typically done for a scalar Whiteman function. You would sum over all of its modes. And you can do this. It's relatively straightforward to construct the sum. What is not straightforward is to ensure the sum converges. By which I mean when you do it numerically, you need to be sure that you've added up enough terms in that sum that you've got convergence, and I speak from experience here. So that is one of the key advantages of this particular uh, case. Now, how do we get to the black hole? Well, the BTZ black hole, I said you've got this covering space, you've got this hyperbolic constraint, and then what you uh, do is, instead of rewriting coordinates to get the metric I had on the previous slide, you can insert this transformation into here, and you discover the constraint is satisfied. That's by design. The metric becomes very similar to what I showed, except you've got a minus 1 here instead of a plus. And you've got this quantity phi. If phi is unidentified, if it goes from minus to plus infinity, then this is what we call anti de Sitter space, or more uh, specifically ads Rindler space. It's the anti de Sitter version of uh, the Rindler space that was constructed many, many years ago uh, for a uniformly accelerated observer in flat space. These are coordinates used by a uniformly accelerated observer in anti de Sitter space. However, if you identify phi by this particular amount, then you get the BTZ black hole more easily seen by rescaling phi to phi tilde and T and R likewise, and then you get this metric uh, right here. And phi tilde varies from 0 to 2 pi. And so that's the coordinate system we typically use, and we often drop 
the tildes. So there it is, and the identification uh, that ensures phi is periodic, you can call it gamma, a map from phi to that thing, if you like, when you're in this particular space. And so what you can do is if you want to understand or make use of the Whiteman function in this space, then you do it by take it's been shown you can do it by taking the Whiteman function for pure EDS and imposing these identifications on it and doing this mode sum. And in practice, the first of these, the sum over n, often factors out canceling the term in the denominator, and so you get one of these, but the more general expression is what I've got down right here. The quantity eta refers to boundary conditions um, of the scalar field uh, at infinity, whether they are twisted or untwisted. I, we generally consider untwisted conditions. All right, so let me talk in brief about the uh, three projects that I thought I'd mention earlier. One is something that Everett and I did, uh, came out earlier this year in JHEP on estimating uh, black hole parameters. And the basic idea of this project, I'm not going to go through the arithmetic uh, too much. What I want to do is sketch out for you what we did, why we did it, and, and uh, uh, some of the main results. So the basic idea was to place uh, one of these detectors, these UDW detectors, in some initial quantum state outside of a black hole. When you do that, the detector will experience Hawking radiation. And then after some time, you can determine whether or not the detector is still, I've got it in the ground state, I meant to say still in the initial state that you set it in, not the ground state. And this will depend on the parameters of the black hole. And the idea is, let's say the black hole, well, let, let's regard the black hole as a system that is not that easy to probe. What can we learn about it just from monitoring this detector at a distance? And the idea is that if you do many repeated experiments of this type, or if you are rich and have like hundreds of UDW detectors, you place them around the black hole, and then you uh, then can compute the probability uh, depending on where it is and on when you looked at it. And from this, you can compute the Fisher information to yield an estimate of the parameters of the black hole. And so that's what we took a look at to see how this would work, and indeed it does. Here is an example, one of the many graphs in our paper. The uh, state quantum state in blue is the initial state of the detector, ground and excited. Uh, with some quantum amplitudes of cos and sine theta. We set the relative phase to be 1. And uh, for a black hole uh, at temperature 0.1, energy gap 1 in units of L, which we took to be 1. If theta is 0, you start in the ground state. And for transparent conditions, you can see that the Fisher information does indeed sensitively depend on the mass of the black hole. So what this means is if you had an ensemble and you waited for a while and measured the uh, probability of the black hole and used that to compute the Fisher information, which I didn't write down here, uh, but it's a well-known expression, you would find that it would peak at various values of tau. And so you could imagine reconstructing this curve and then saying, oh, well, this black hole has such and such a mass. Or... Uh, such and such a temperature, and so on, as the case may be. So the point of this exercise is that it's an in-principle exercise to demonstrate that quantities such as Fisher information that are used in other experiment to estimate hard-to-access parameters uh, can also be applied to black hole physics. All right, now another thing we're working on that's going to come out probably later this afternoon, if I'm really lucky, uh, is falling into a black hole. In fact, I'm not going to talk about the main thing that will come out a bit later. Rather, I'm going to talk about the prelim to it. The equivalence principle, which says a pound of feathers weighs the same as a pound of lead, also says that locally space-time is flat. And that's true anywhere, even in the vicinity of an event horizon. 
And so if you have a local enough experiment, which means if you're in a small enough region of space and time, as that region, cro well of space, as that region crosses through an event horizon, nothing special should happen. Now you hear these stories about getting stretched like a piece of spaghetti if you fall into a black hole. Well, that's true for a solar mass black hole, but it's true because your body is not a local object on that scale. The gravity at your feet is a lot stronger than at your head, so if you dive in feet first, yeah, you'll get stretched like spaghetti. Uh, you won't live very long, mind you. But if you had a black hole that was large enough, massive enough, so that its surface gravity were the same as the Earth, you wouldn't know. You'd feel the way you do right now, assuming all people listening are on the planet. Um, so what that means is the response of a quantum detector should be monotonic or at least smooth, certainly not exhibit a thermal response. Now, this has been looked at in one plus one dimensions by uh, Erickson Joa. Uh, Ken Yoshimura and I in a paper that we put out a couple of years ago, but it's a limited sort of test because one plus one metric doesn't really solve an Einstein equation. It's rather a truncated Schwarzschild metric. Uh, recently, in this paper that came out last year with Keith Chen and Yorma, uh, we actually tested this for a Schwarzschild black hole. This folklore has been around for decades, but only here. And here, was it actually explicitly tested? And I'll talk about that a bit. And right now, we're just finishing off uh, with Maria Rosa, Menar, Yorma, and Max, various things on testing this in, uh, for the 2 plus 1 black hole. So here, I'm showing you a result from the paper with Keith, Chen, and Yorma on the Schwarzschild metric. Uh, what we wanted to do was see if what everybody said was right, what will happen if you let a UDW detector freely fall into a Schwarzschild black hole. How will it respond? That was the question we asked. Will it do what everybody says? Because you can't find anywhere in the literature where it was done. And I always wondered why, and <clears throat> as I got halfway through the project, I knew why. It's because this is very painful. And the pain is that mode sum that I told you people about earlier. Getting that mode sum to converge for the various vacua, Hartle, Hawking, Unruh, or Boulware, is very difficult. You add up thousands and thousands of terms, and you're still not sure it converges. The laptops run all night. They crash. You do it again. It's, anyway, we did it. But it's not easy. And here in the upper uh, right is a diagram of what we did. The red part is where the detector is switched on. And what we do in this diagram is vary the center point of this red region along the trajectory, the blue trajectory of the detector. And we then measure the response of the detector at the midpoint of the region. So you can see all these discrete dots. That's what we actually did. And then the curves are just joined together by I. Now what should happen is these curves should just smoothly do this. But you can see they don't. There is, as we called it, a little excitement as it crosses the horizon. We do not know why this is. This is the point of testing the 2 plus 1 case that Maria Rosa is going to talk about later. So let me finish off with black hole superposition. Uh, we still lack a quantum theory of gravity, and there's a general expectation that whatever the quantum theory of gravity is, it's going to let us put space-time in quantum superposition. At least if it, it should. If it doesn't, there better be a darn good reason why everything else does in quantum physics or has that capacity. So we specifically have been looking at the superposition of black holes, and in particular of BTZ black holes, and the reason why, uh, again, the BTZ hole is useful is its constancy of curvature allowed us to use methods from uh, the quantum reference framework of people like uh, Chaslav Bruckner and Flamina, uh, Flaminia Giacomini and Esteban uh, Castro Ruiz, all these people and so on, uh, to do this. And so our thing is, it's one thing to put it in superposition 
How would you know what it looked like? Well, go to the store, buy a UDW detector and see how it responds. So that is what we are looking at. And so the superposed BTZ black hole, here's that BTZ metric written in the other coordinates, so the identification is with root 2m. What you can do using the quantum reference frame method is superpose identifications for different values of m. One for mass A, one for mass B. And the Whiteman function then uh, for the superposed case more generally is given by this identified sum over the ADS Whiteman functions and uh, in the superposed case instead of the single gamma you have a gamma for A and gamma for B and then you get four different quantities AA, AB, BA and BB and you get uh, the quantum amplitudes for each and you have to add them all up as per usual quantum physics. Here is what happens in the non-rotating case. We find as a function of the square root of mb over ma, and that'll have meaning later as Dickey will point out uh, in his talk, the resonant, there are resonant peaks at integer values of these ratios. This is certainly consistent of a conjecture Jacob Beckenstein made decades ago that black hole mass should be quantized. And we are in some sense seeing a detector respond in this way. Recently we have done work on rotation, but that's for Dickey to talk about and I'll leave that to him. So, those are the three things I want to talk about, but there's lots more. I think you're going to hear from Arenio about how you can extract tripartite in the environment of a black hole. Uh, Ken Yoshimura and Vaishant Thacker and I have been working on Unruh Auto Engines. Ken uh, and Laura Henderson have also worked with me on the first one. Uh, Dhuman Bhattacharya, Laura, Ken and Vaish... Uh, oh, Vaishant wasn't on that one. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, worked on uh, the relationship between entanglement and gravitational shock waves, building on work Erickson and David Kubiznak did, and Finn Gray. Um, Dhuman Bhattacharya has been working on whether how detectors respond if the inside of a black hole is way more complicated topologically than we generally naively expect it to be. I think you're going to hear from Lana Bozanic later about uh, the circular Unruh effect when you have detector uh, a UDW detector orbiting in a circle it experiences a uniform acceleration towards its center and we carried out a study recently on quantum entanglement in that setting and she will tell you about that work with Minar and Ken. Uh, I've talked, uh, we're thinking uh, with all these people here, uh, Everett, Maria, Lakshay, Josh, Magdalena, Dickey, Nayesh F. Shorty, on what it means to superpose space-time, so we're developing different projects to try and flesh that out, and we continue studying uh, what happens when detectors fall across the horizon, and Sajia and Maria and I are beginning a project to try and understand what happens for entangled detectors in that regard. So I think, actually, I'm a little bit early, which nobody ever is bothered by at a meeting, so thanks a lot for your attention.